Hi guys, this is a lecture for Thursday, week 3, spring of 2021. I've already done this, and for whatever reason, Virtual Classroom and Brightspace lost it. And my backup recording didn't work, so hey, let's do it one more time. So vitamin B, we're, we've been talking about vitamin B12. Last time we talked in detail about how vitamin B12 gets absorbed by the body. And let's now look at some things that can go wrong now that we know how it can be absorbed by the body. So, uh, and then we did start talking about pernicious anemia too last time. And we said that, uh, that there's several different causes which we'll look at today. But it basically means that B12 is not being reabsorbed by the body. And we need vitamin B12 to do two important things DNA synthesis of all the blood cells especially red blood cells and then you need vitamin b12 to make myelinin which is the covering around your nerves um, so your nerves can short circuit and you can have messed up blood if you don't have enough vitamin b12 in your body so let's look at the blood findings of someone with pernicious anemia and remember we said for board purposes, if you see pernicious anemia, you just assume that they're talking about type A, which is the autoimmune attack against parietal cells. You just assume that unless they say otherwise. All right? So if you have an attack if you, against parietal cells, you're not making acid or intrinsic factor. If you're not making acid, there's no way to shut off your G cells. And if the G cells are doing their thing, they secrete gastrin. So you'll have very high blood levels of gastrin, which is called hypergastrinemia. So G cells run wild, they over secrete gastrin. And um, yeah, uh, if the G cells are always working over time, just like a bodybuilder who's working all the time on their muscles. G cells can get big under the microscope. So you can have some G cell hyperplasia. And we know um, that gastrin also binds to ECL cells and causes the release of histamine. Then the histamine binds to prior cells too. That mechanism is uh, overworking as well. So you get ECL cell hyperplasia as well. Um, and the blood, because we said vitamin B12 is needed to make, make all blood cells, you get something called pancytopenia. Pancytopenia, which is a deficiency in all of the mature adult blood cells, especially red blood cells, but white blood cells and platelets as well. And that's because DNA synthesis is messed up in the bone marrow. So hematopoiesis is messed up. You can't make blood cells. We'll look exactly here in a second. Well, we're looking at it right now, specific blood work findings. Macrocytosis occurs, and that is a condition in which the blood is filled with immature red blood cells that are bigger than normal. And yeah, uh, specifically those immature blood cells have a name, and, and um, those well, the disease has a name. It's also called megalocytosis or macrocythemia. And that just means that's the same as macrocytosis. Um, and that's not a disease in and of itself. Those, that's a finding where you have these immature red blood cells living around. Okay, And macroovalocytosis is another word that we should know. So this is another way to describe this condition. We have abnormally large and oval-shaped red blood cells. So th these are some more blood-specific blood work findings. So macrocytosis. And we can get more specific now on the type of macrocytosis. So we have macroovalocytosis, where we have big blood cells, and they're especially the red blood cells, and they're oval in shape. Uh, they're, they're so big, they're as big as lymphocytes, sometimes even bigger than lymphocytes. So these patients have 
macrocytosis, more specifically, some of the findings of macroovalocytosis. We have another one uh, called anecocytosis or anisocytosis. This is unequal sized red blood cells. So we have some big round ones, but we have some little kind of crescent shaped ones and all kinds of weird different sizes. So unequal red blood cells. Poikilocytosis is an abnormal shape. You could describe the blood cells as sickle shape or star shape. Okay, and then we have neutrophils, which usually have a couple, a couple segments. They have six, seven, eight, nine, ten segments, so hypersegmented neutrophils. Let's refresh our blood chemistry, what blood smear looks like. So normally these are the red blood cells floating around. They are, they have a good sized nucleus here. Or, well, it's not a nucleus. They just have this pallor center. They don't have a nucleus. They're a special type of cell. I won't get into that. Dr. Dole's already taught you that. Uh, but look at the size. Here's a lymphocyte. There's a neutrophil. They're smaller than these cells. They should never be bigger. They also have these, these pal regions are big, which was once the nucleus. So keep that in mind. Now look at this. So here's a patient uh, with pernicious anemia. And there is a there is a lymphocyte, right? lymphocyte, red blood cells. Now look at the lymphocyte. Look at these gigantic red blood cells. And they've lost their, their, their pallor. They're missing their central zone of pallor. And look at the weird sizes, right? They're different shapes. Look at that one and look at that one. So this, this smear is said to have poikilocytosis. Um, there's different sizes, so you could say this is a necocytosis as well. Um, yeah, so this patient has macrocytosis. And the more specific findings, well, they also have macroovalocytosis because there's some big oval-shaped ones here. So they have all of the classic findings of pernicious anemia. Uh, or specifically, or, or even more specific, or even less specifically, you could say megaloblastic anemia. But remember, pernicious anemia is a bi vitamin B12 deficiency. You could have a folic acid deficiency and still have megaloblastic anemia. And, and it, would look, it would look exactly the same. Right? Here's a neutrophil, <clears throat> hypersegmented neutrophil. You should only have two, three lobes uh, for neutrophils. And these have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, also, look at, look at these red blood cells. Some of them are okay. These are okay. But look at, look at the little tiny nucleus here that central zone of pallor. So we have a dissociation between the cytosol and what would be the nucleus. So that's called cytosol nucleus dissociation or nuclear cytosolic dissociation, either way. That's another sign of megaloblastic anemia. All right, um, bone marrow findings. So if you take bone marrow sample, what's going on inside? You have all these premature enlarged erythroblasts, which are the precursors to a mature red blood cell, or these erythroblasts. Uh, and yeah, and when you find these in the bone marrow, too many of these, they're called megaloblasts. Some authors say megaloblasts and erythroblasts are AKAs. Some differentiate them. We'll just say they're AKAs. Um, but eventually, these immature, giant, weird-looking shells, look at cells, look at the shape of that one. They end up in the bloodstream. And then again, they have nuclear cytoplasmic disassociation. Why is that? That's because to make cytosol in a growing erythroblast, you use RNA synthesis to make the cytosol. So you're going to have normal, normal cytosol. But to make the nucleus, you use DNA synthesis. And that's messed up because you don't have vitamin B12. And so you get immature nucleuses. And that's why you get that way too much cytosol look to a tiny little nucleus because of that 
phenomenon, RNA synthesis, cytosol, DNA synthesis in the nucleus. What about neurological findings? So if the patient hasn't gotten blood work yet, which is very possible, blood work is really expensive. They don't, people don't like to get blood work because it's so expensive. Um, they may come into your office with neurological sequelae or neurological findings. And that may be the first thing to appear. And yeah, these patients may come into your office. Um, eventually, just side note, CNS lesions of the brain or spinal cord are found in about 75% of cases with pernicious anemia. The classic finding is called a symmetrical dysesthesia in both the upper and the lower extremities. What is that? That's a painful, um, not always painful, but it's often painful, irritating, numbing, tingling, burning sensation, uh, which can be found in, in radicular pain from sciatica, from a disc herniation can cause that. The difference is when it's a disc herniation or spinal stenosis that causes a, a radicular pain. It's isolated to one, maybe two dermatones. People with symmetrical dysesthesias, they're not in a dermatone or may, maybe four dermatones. The entire arm is affected. So that makes it, makes you think it's not a run of the mill radicular type pain. And it's typically matching on the right versus the left. And it can switch around like a neuropathic pain. It can be in, the, let's say, the C5 dermatone in the morning and that switches over to the C7 dermatone. And then it's the C6 and T8 dermatone that moves around. That's possible as well. All right. And what causes this? It's because there's no myelinin. The myelinin has to be replaced in our nerves all the time. If you don't have vitamin B12, you can't replace the myelinin and you get short circuits in the wire basically remember myelinin is like the you know, like the casing around a electrical wire and if you don't have a casing you can get shocked and that's kind of what happens and when that happens in pain fiber you get spontaneous action potentials and that sends a signal of pain to your brain and you think you have you have um, a problem remember we talked about the MMA invasion of nerves, methylmalonic acid builds up. We got into the weeds a little bit about how that happened. So what are this? Well, wow, look at all the stars on this slide. This has been on every test I've ever created because this is a slide you'll take with you into practice with you. What are the other things that can cause this dysesthesia, this tingling, burning, numbing pain? Um, well, it could be a disc herniation could be spinal stenosis or central disc herniation. Uh, it's possible it could cause bilateral. It's unlikely it would be in the up all four extremities. But some of the big ones, multiple sclerosis, any demyelinating disease could do it. Um, Lyme's disease, Guillain-Barre syndrome, pernicious anemia is what we're talking about. That can be on the list here as well, but that's not a differential diagnosis. That's the main diagnosis. And small fiber neuropathy from uncontrolled diabetes can cause nerves to spontaneously fire. And then chronic, chronic widespread pain syndrome, which is very complex. I'm sure you'll have classes in that as you uh, go forward. But that's a brain processing where pain is not processed correctly. And your brain gets confused as to where one pain generator is. So it starts making up pain generators. Fibromyalgia, central sensitization are key words in this chronic widespread pain syndrome. Some more serious findings that could show up, ataxia. Um, so that is the patient is wobbly. They're having trouble walking, especially with their eyes closed. They're wobbly. They might have a wide gait. Uh, when you test their muscles, they might have spasticity uh, in the muscles uh, where you go to gently stretch a muscle and they resist, but they're not trying to resist. The muscle is spastic. They could have an upper motor neuron lesion from this condition. So Babinski's Hoffman's test might be positive. Romberg's test might be positive. Um, that's a great test for cervical myelopathy. We'll save that discussion for another day. Um, and then toward the end stages, it can cause dementia. It can mess up the brain and you can have memory loss from that as well. How about some other causes of megaloblastic anemia? Uh, and again, we talked about that more in the last lecture, but megaloblastic anemia, main causes, vitamin B12 deficiency, 
vitamin B9 deficiency. So, um, but there are some other causes as well. Alcohol overuse uh, can cause trouble with, with DNA synthesis, and you can get megaloblastic anemia, uh, anemia from that. Um, certain medications can do it. Won't worry about those. Um, any type of disease that interferes with DNA synthesis, HIV virus can do that. Uh, leukemia, some of the malodysplastic d disorders can do that as well. How about some associations? Well, run-of-the-mill pernicious anemia, we said if you see pernicious anemia, think type A pernicious anemia. It's assumed A stands for autoimmune. That's attack of the, uh, the, of the parietal cells. And so if you have one autoimmune problem going on, you may well have another one going on. So watch out for diabetes, type 1 diabetes, Hashimoto's disease. Uh, that is hypothyroidism, about 10% get that. And vitiligo is autoimmune, uh, where the melanocytes get attacked and they stop working, and you get this symmetrical absence of melanin. And this is what all humans, the color all humans would look like without melanocytes activated. This is obviously a African-American here, and this can happen in any race of people, but it's more pronounced on them. Normal skin, skin without melanin firing. It's weird how it's so symmetrical. We'll look at that in dermatology in seventh quarter. Other associations you got to watch out for, here's a big one, is gastric carcinoma. Uh, because if they have type A pernicious anemia, they're going to have stomach upset. And that's a condition in and of itself. Uh, that's, you know, well, well, will we start that today? I think we'll just start to talk about the, uh, the gastropathies, but that is one of the, uh, the atrophic conditions. Uh, but there is a 26.4 fold increase for carcinoma of the fundic region from this, and that's from a chronic inflammation. You've got an autoimmune attack of the stomach lining, uh, and constant inflammation is going to cause cells to start to morph into other types of cells, and some of those can become cancerous. Iron deficiency anemia is found in about 25% of these patients, so watch out for that. Um, that is the number one type of anemia, by the way, is iron deficiency anemia. And it has to do with dysfunctional hemoglobin. We won't get into that today, but without hemoglobin, you can't carry oxygen, so you get the classic anemia symptoms. You're tired and run down, bruise easily, more association. So atrophic glossitis. So some people with an autoimmune attack against parietal cells, turns out that some of the cells in the tongue resemble parietal cells, and the body attacks your tongue. And from chronic bouts of inflammation and healing and inflammation and healing, you get a collagen deposition here, and the tongue gets smooth and shiny from all the scar tissue built up underneath. So you get this atrophic glossitis. Sometimes it's called the bald tongue. And so watch out for that. Another picture of it. Other causes of B12 deficiency. So type A. B12 deficiency, pernicious anemia, is not the only one out there. There's a type B pernicious anemia, and that's really easy. B stands for bug. It's caused by some type of bug, and when you talk about bugs in the stomach, it's almost always one called H. pylori, So, and that when, that is what causes type B pernicious anemia. Uh, it's, this, it's the sequelae from a chronic... HP infection of the stomach. Um, this is one of the gastritis we're going to talk about, specifically atrophic multifocal gastritis. We'll get to that. And yeah, there's the bug. There's the H. pylori bug right there. And this bug will destroy the fundic glands as well. Um, and we'll learn that when you er, early on when you get an HP infection, it doesn't attack the fundic region of the stomach. It attacks the antral region. But with the passage of time, and with certain strains of this bug, it can move in to the fundic region. And it does like the fundic glands and the parietal cells and the chief cells. And you get a chronic inflammation of those cells because of that. And, you know, that... That can cause cancer, the chronic inflammation as well, but it can destroy the stomach. And that's exactly what happens. 
and it causes tummy upset. Tummy upset is, the medical word for that is dyspepsia. Dyspepsia. Therefore, you get, uh, for someone with type B pernicious anemia, what are the signs? What are the findings? Well, you get decreased hydrochloric acid, decreased pepsinogen, decreased intrinsic factor. That's the hipster guy, right? So hipster is gone. And this is the difference because the HP infection is also, it started in the antral region and is affecting G cells. Um, it wrecks the G cells in the chronic phases. So you'll finally have decreased gastrin levels. Interestingly, when, when HP first affects the pyloric region of the stomach, it doesn't destroy that region. Um, instead, it irritates those cells into overproducing gastrin. So you have hypergastrinemia early on, and that's called non-atrophic gastritis, and we'll look at that uh, soon. How about some other blood work findings in type B, the bug pernicious anemia? Um, so you're not going to find any autoantibodies. We talked about last time the type 1, type 2, and type 3 autoantibodies. Uh, the there will be decreased levels of B12, of course, because there's no intrinsic factor. There's, there's no, we need the hipster to, to make vitamin B12 get reabsorbed, so decreased vitamin B12. Um, and you'll have megaloblastic anemia because you don't have vitamin B12. Uh, and so immature, oversized, over-lobulated blood cells, megaloblast you'll have, you'll have nuclear, nuclear cytoplasmic dissociation, poikilocytosis, anechocytosis, macroovalocytosis, everything we said last time goes with megaloblastic anemia. All right, how about another, yet another type of pernicious anemia, a malabsorptive pernicious anemia, or MPA. So there's many conditions that can cause malabsorptive uh, pernicious anemia, uh, and all of them interfere with the absorption of vitamin B12. And it could be problems with mutations in the gene, really rare condition, mutations in the gene that make heptocrin. Without heptocrin, we can't absorb B12. Uh, it could be problem mutations with the cubulin receptors or cabam receptors that actually take vitamin B12 in the distal ileum. So they lump all these conditions into malabsorptive pernicious anemia. Let's look at just a few of them. One is intrinsic factor deficiency. Now, don't get this confused with type A pernicious anemia uh, where the fundic gland is destroyed and intrinsic factor doesn't work because of, the, because of the inflammation. This is a congenital mutation of the genes that actually make intrinsic factor. So the vital cells, specifically the machinery that makes intrinsic factors, are mutated. And so without intrinsic factor, you can't, you can't reabsorb vitamin B12. Okay, so no intrinsic factor, and depending how bad the mutation is, maybe you can still make a little intrinsic factor. So you'll, you'll have just a little bit of vitamin B12 absorption. So it can, there's a broad spectrum of mutations that can occur, from complete knockout mutations where you don't have any, intrinsic factor made to partial mutations where maybe 50% of intrinsic factors knocked out. But no intrinsic factor, no B12 absorption, no B12 absorption equals vitamin B12 deficiency equals megaloblastic anemia, uh, which is a form of macrocytic anemia. Um, so are you going to have, and I like to ask these questions, so if, if, you, if you don't have the gene to make intrinsic factor, are you going to have tummy upset? No, there's nothing, there's nothing attacking and irritating the stomach. You're just not making B12, so your tummy's going to be okay. So no abdominal pain either. Uh, let's see. No autoimmune di diagnosis. Yeah, so these patients, they do not have autoantibodies, is guess what I'm trying to say there in that poorly worded heading. Um, these patients don't have autoimmune disease, so there's no autoantibodies to detect either. And there's no, if you go down there with the endoscope, there's no damage to the stomach. And the, what about, here's another question. What are the hydrochloric acid levels in pepsin and gastrin levels in these patients? 
they'll be normal. They'll, they just have a mutated gene for intrinsic factors. They won't have intrinsic factor, but all these will be fine. Okay, stomach examination will be normal. There's no inflammation going on. Okay, how about another MPA? How about pro, uh, same thing, but this time you have a proton pump mutation. You can have hydrogen potassium ATPase mutations that are specific for the stomach lining, and it's the same deal. There's no inflammation, there's no autoantibodies. You just can't, you just can't make acid, right? So you have, and depending if it's a full knockout mutation, maybe you'll have no acid production. Maybe if it's a partial, you have just a tiny bit. So there's many, many possibilities with this, but a full knockout mutation of the hydrogen potassium pumps of the, of, of the stomach, and you'll have achlorhydria. And remember, decreased acid was hypochlorhydria. Achlorhydria is just no acid being produced. How do you find these? You have to go in with an endoscope and sample gastric juices to see what's going on in there. And then these patients are going to have hypergastrinemia. Uh, because without acid, there's nothing to shut off the G cells, right? There's nobody, there's nobody to turn them off. Uh, so remember, we said that that high levels of hydrogen ion, uh, via somatostatin, shut down G cells, and that's not, that's not around. Uh, let's see. So no hydrochloric acid equals no vitamin B12 absorption. Yeah, you need hydrochloric acid to make uh, to break off the tail of a pepsinogen molecule to make pepsin and you need pepsin to break loose the food binding protein so yeah you can't you can't reabsorb b12 um, and you can still develop megaloblastic anemia because anytime you don't reabsorb b12 or folic acid for that matter you're going to have megaloblastic anemia we said an aka a category over megaloblastic anemia is macrocytic anemia. Talked about that last time, macrocytic and non-macrocytic anemias. Uh, no dyspepsia, no abdominal pain either. This is not an inflammatory disease. It's a mutation problem. All right, how about another type of MPA, pancreatic insufficiency? Ooh, we've heard that right. Exocrine, EPI, you hear all the time on the commercials these days. Very, very rare. Um, anyway, if there's something wrong with the exocrine function of the pancreas, in other words, namely, it's not secreting the pancreatic proteases we also talked about last time, trypsinogen and chymotrypsin, then B12 cannot release heptocorin because you need the pancreatic proteases to break loose B12 from heptocorin. So then intrinsic factor can bind. So if you don't have pancreatic proteases, you can't break loose B12 from heptocrine. B12 and heptocrine cannot be reabsorbed in the distal ileum by cabam receptors. So you have pernicious, so you get vitamin B12 deficiency. So that's another type of MPA. Right, everything I said. How about the symptoms of the patient? No hypergastrinemia. Yeah, hydrochloric acid is fine, so that's they won't have hypergastrinemia. They won't have achlorhydria or hypochlorhydria. The stomach mechanisms are working fine. Just a problem further downstream. Um, how about another type of MPA, distal ileal disease? So some of these diseases that attack, uh, there are some diseases that attack the cubulin receptors or the CABAM, a.k.a. CABAM receptors, and that's what takes intrinsic factor B12 complex in, uh, gets it into the body, gets it into the bloodstream through those cells, through those distal ileoenterocytes. Who is the culprit for this? Crohn's disease, which we are going to talk about this quarter, since I cut a lot of the, the endocrinology out. We have room for Crohn's disease and some of these other diseases. So Crohn's disease loves the distal ileum. And that's an inflammatory disease, so it can inflame the, the ileocytes, or the cells there, and the cabam receptors get damaged, and they don't work. Uh, what about hypergastrinemia? No, there's not going to be any hypergastrinemia. The stomach machinery is working fine. So gastrin levels will be normal. There'll be no hypo or chlorhydria or achlorhydria. Everything, all those stomach juices will be fine. 
How about another MPA? Not so much in our country, but down by the equator, you can get tapeworm, Sestoda. And Sestoda eats B12, an intrinsic factor, like candy, like Skittles. It loves it. And so there's nothing wrong with any of your machinery. It's just the fact you have a creature that's gobbling up the B12 intrinsic factor complex and you're not getting it, so you develop pernicious anemia or vitamin B12 deficiency and megaloblastic anemia because of that. If, once you figure that out and kill the bug, you'll be right back to normal. All right, so that's the end of vitamin B12 and its associated problems. Let's just start talking about stomach disorders and go from there. So, very common problem. Nearly one-third of all health care spending in the United States occurs secondary to GI disease. And it's a frequent cause of significant morbidity, um, even mortality and sometimes. But, I mean, people don't feel good. Your life can be ruined by stomach problems. Uh, inflammatory diseases and neoplastic diseases are common as well. In fact, gastric carcinoma worldwide speaking, is the third uh, type of cancer death in the world. <clears throat> we don't hear about it that much. It's, so let's meet, we talk, I've been talking about these gastropathies. Let's talk about the chronic gastropathies, I like to call them. Uh, Robbins and Rubens call them chronic gastritis, which is not a great, itis means inflammation. These are not all inflammatory disorders, so that's really not the best thing to call them. It's better to call them the can of chronic gastropathies, but I want you to know because that could show up on boards. All right, so this system of classifying stomach disorders uh, was made by a whole bunch of meetings in Sydney, Australia, so they get the name, the updated Sydney classification system. So um, there's a difference between these chronic gastropathies or gastritis's than the acute gastritis. Acute gastritis is an inflammation of the stomach lining because you have done something you shouldn't have done, like take five shots of moonshine. That'll give you acute gastritis. You have to really work to uh, to get acute gastritis. Alcoholics can get gast acute gast gastritis really easily. Or you accidentally drink antifreeze or something like that. We'll look at some of the causes of that. But this chronic gastropathy, uh, much more common than, than these acute bouts of gastritis. Um, and it is the number one cause of chronic stomach upset. In fact, we could go a step further. It's an HP infection, non-atrophic gastritis, which I don't think we're going to start maybe just touching on that. When you tummy upset, the medical word is dyspepsia. Dyspepsia is tummy upset. Um, tummy upset, dyspepsia, and these chronic gastropathies, the symptoms can be difficult to tell apart from GERD sometimes. Very tough to tell apart. They can overlap, and it's hard to tell one from the other, or you might have both going on. Fun fact, it's thought about 50% of the world's population is currently affected by this condition, at least to some degree. Can be completely asymptomatic, which makes it tough. Some of these are associated with cancer, so that the first symptom might be related to cancer. Um, and if untreated, it can lead to cancer, stomach cancer, um, and other diseases, PUD, peptic ulcer disease, an ulcer, a hole in the stomach lining or the proximal intestinal lining. Um, gastric hyperplastic polyps, I took all those out because they're rare and I just don't have time to cover everything here. I have a YouTube video on that one somewhere. And yeah, stomach cancer as well. So you got to get this gastritis under control. Classifying this, when I developed this course from scratch, what a, a mess. The authors are all over the place. This is, the, this is one of the hardest lecture series I've ever put together. It's as bad as, as embryology was a mess. This is a mess too. So keep that in mind, big mess. And that's because some authors classify the, the specific diseases of the stomach based on symptoms. Others classify them based on endoscopic appearance. Others classify them on histological appearance. And they all have their favorite names, of course, and you're, we're going to look at some crazy AKAs here in a minute. 
So let's meet this updated Sydney classification system. Here it is, nice and neat, as neat as possible. Uh, and there's three, let's just look, there's three main categories. There's non-atrophic gastritis, atrophic gastritis, and special forms of gastritis. So let's look at some of these. So there's the first category is non-atrophic gastritis. That one's straightforward. It's an H. pylori infection uh, that affects the fundic region of the stomach. Unfortunately, we got a lot of AKAs for these things. Um, so superficial gastritis, diffuse antrogastritis, chronic antrogastritis, interstitial uh, follicular gastritis, hypersecretory gastritis, type B, HP gastritis, Robbins, HP associated gastritis, H. pylori gastritis. Oh my gosh. We'll break these down here in a minute. I'm not going to go through all these, but uh, you can see why this is such a hard time reading papers and figuring out this and Robbins and Rubens are absolutely terrible on this, by the way. They, they really need to spend some time bringing these chapters up to speed and, and using the correct terminology. Anyway, so non-atrophic gastritis is an HP infection. Atrophic gastritis is an autoimmune attack of the parietal cells. So that's easy. That's one type. That's a subtype. Another subtype is called multifocal atrophic gastritis, and that's caused from an inflammation probably secondary to environmental factors like cigarette smoke, pollution, people are sensitive, it may be dairy, maybe a chronic H. pylori infection. And we'll get into the, each one of these more. And then chemical gastritis can be from many things. Uh, moonshine, alcohol, bile regurgitation into the stomach, overuse of NSAIDs, radiation, uh, there's infections that are lymphocyte heavy. There's non granulomatous infections like Crohn's disease, uh, eosinophilic. There's many here. We're not going to get into this because I just don't have time. We're going to talk about mainly just this gastritis, the chemical gastritis form. And we're going to talk about non-atrophic and atrophic. And that's all the time that we have. And those are the three main categories. Let's just touch on non-atrophic gastritis, the first category of Sydney, as we said. There are no subcategories. Ridiculous amount of AKAs. You ready for this? Well, I already told you them. But oh my gosh, look at all these AKAs. How are we going to, when you're on boards, how are you going to know which ones to use? Well, we're probably they'll stick with Robbins. And Robbins, um, they, Robbins has... HP built in to the to the to the description, so that's easy. H. pylori associated gastritis, HP gastritis, H. pylori gastritis. Uh, so that's at least good. Now, if you're a medical student, you have to go by whatever board book that you use. They do like type B gastritis and antrogastritis. So these ones in red are fair game for the test. I'm not gonna ask. Uh, the other ones, but look for these these four keywords to help you. There will be gastritis in the word, and then look for antral or HP or non-atrophic or type B. So I'll probably stick with these or non-atrophic gastritis, which is the correct term from the Sydney classification. That's the one that Robbins and Rubens need to adopt really quickly my humble opinion. So shame, shame, Robbins, shame. Um, and so why is HP pyloric gastritis a bad name? I didn't tell you why it's a bad name. It's a terrible name because H. pylori causes non-atrophic gastritis. Okay, so that would make, but the problem is H. pylori can also cause atrophic gastritis. So it's a terrible description because, I mean, which one do you mean? when you talk about H. pylori, H. pylori gastritis, because it causes non-atrophic gastritis and atrophic gastritis. So, shame. Okay. Uh, so what is it after all that? Um, it's a condition, as I've already said, where H. pylori attacks the antral region of the stomach, and it results in a chronic inflammation that's not super damaging at first, but it's enough to set off nociceptors and cause tummy upset or to cause dyspepsia. 
Okay, the inflammation doesn't destroy early on. Later, it can destroy the entire stomach, but early on, it doesn't. It just irritates pyloric, uh, pyloric glands, uh, and those, of course, contain the G cells. And if the G cells get irritated, they oversecrete gastrin, and therefore, um, you're going to have hypergastrinemia, right? And that's going to drive the overproduction of acid. Um, there's no atrophy of the stomach tissue in and of itself. Um, what is the cause of this? Well, we already said it's H. pylori. Uh, certain strains, most strains of it start out here, to my understanding. Um, and it always starts out in the anteroregion region of the stomach. And it could move after many years and take over the entire stomach. And then you're going to have destruction. That's atrophic gastritis. But at first it causes a non-atrophic gastritis. It is the most common form of chronic gastritis, period. So of all these stomach conditions we're going to look at, H. pylori is a menace. It's, this is the cause of it. All right, <clears throat> that's enough. So here is, it's not a bird today. So I got this a couple days ago when it rained uh, over in Kirby Park. And this, I kind of hid in the bank of the saloon. And this little guy came right up to me and smiled at me. And I was like, I didn't notice this until I got home. He's a vampire. He's got gigantic canine teeth. So I've never seen a sea otter that looks like that. So can you guys handle that for your bonus question on the test? That is a sea otter. Is that a red-tailed hawk? No. Is that a kite? No. Okay. See you guys later.